J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Good evening, everybody. I'm J.T. Crowley, and joining me today is Linda Hockey, a children's author from New Mexico in the United States of America. Linda, with her husband, Mike, a retired surgical pathologist, has lived in several places in the United States, Boston, Oklahoma, just to name a few. Uh, But she now lives in the mountains in New Mexico, up towards the Colorado state line. And it's there that she lives with her dogs and also the odd stray mountain lion or cougar who happens to pop in to visit her. Also with a few black bears who decide, oh, there's a barbecue on offer. Let's go and have a visit and um, go and have a sniff. So she has um, quite an interesting life up in the mountains there. Um, But she's mum to uh, Morgan and Owen and she has three grandchildren. But She spent most of her life um, surrounded by hunting dogs and, um, you know, talking to children, reading to children and teaching children all about books. So let's find out a little bit more about her. Let's invite her on the show and let's see what she's got to say, everybody. Linda. John, glad to be here. It's great to invite you on and to be able to chat to you about your um, a wonderful series of books. And, and of course, you know, here, I mean, I'm sitting here in the UK, so it's evening for me, and for you, it's morning, isn't it? That's right. Isn't it wonderful, Zoom? Yes, absolutely. Oh, it's great. Linda, um, do you want to talk to us uh, a little bit about yourself and how you came to write the five books that's in the Hickory Dock uh, Tales collection. Um, Because these books, you know, I've read them, they're magical and they're spellbinding and I absolutely love them. And of course, the age range is five to nine. So, you you know, go and tell us a little bit about yourself and why have you written these books and why now? I'd love to tell you about myself. I love the dogs that we have. We've had 30 years, or 30 hunting dogs, I should say, during our years. And I've also dealt with children. I did teach high school a long time ago, and I've also been involved in two museums in which we worked with young children. And around the year 2000, I decided I'd better put down in writing the memories of all of my animals and all of their experiences when they were out in the hunting field or just simply with us in the kennels. And so that's what I've done. Wow. I mean, because um, you know, the, the, uh, the kennels, uh, you know, the hacienda, and I, I love the address that you put you know, in the book as to where the kennels are. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, and of course, you know, all the other animals that are all going to be coming into the ball play, you know, when, uh, ladies and gentlemen and kids, you're going to see, they're going to be, it's a wonderful array of characters in these books. Now, Linda, you've already touched on this, but you go into, um, schools, museums and talk to children. Clearly this is a great passion of yours. So when you go into those places, um, What are you trying to achieve? And do you love teaching kids? I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, you wouldn't do if you didn't, Um, would you? That's right. That's (laughs) absolutely right. But when I go into the schools and I, uh, my books can really go on up to the fifth grade. Basically in the first grade, the teacher, we've had a teacher in a school that actually read my first book, Hickory Docks Tales to the children. Um, So when I go into these schools and I work with the children, I sit down to read the book and we actually walk through the book. 
And I've done that a lot with the children. And that is we might take a few pages and then I'll ask questions about it. What I'm trying to accomplish is to give them the love of reading and actually the love of, act, of writing also, of using their creativity. I can put a painting or one of my books up in front of them and say, if I put you inside of this painting or book, what would you hear? What would you see? What would you feel? What would you taste? What would you smell? And when you start to do that with children, they begin to understand about writing and reading. I've even gone into the schools and I've, we, we, I've taken the children outside. And as soon as we get outside, I, I will say, this is a book. So tell me, what are you looking at? What is the first thing that you see? What, are your, what characters do you want? And so they learn that way. And that is important. And I believe you and I've talked about this before, but iPads um, and all of the computer um, items that children have, that's great and wonderful. But the most important thing is to sit down with a real book and to actually turn the pages. You stop time when you do that. And you actually enjoy, I believe, that the children can enjoy reading and learning about life's lessons, but in a humorous way, not in a, um, you know, different type of way, but just a humorous way. So, I mean, and I do love doing it. Yeah. I mean, for me, books are escapism. It's a means of escaping. And my mum was a, um, an English teacher and she tried to teach me uh, with great difficulty because when I was nine, 10, all I was interested, I was just a boy, a lad. I just wanted to go outside and have fun outside. You know, reading books was just, oh, it was a chore. Now my brother loved them. So, you know, we were very different. But, uh, yeah, I always see books as escapism and, you know, great places to dream. And I think a lot of kids do that, don't they? Yes, absolutely. Oh. And I, yes, they do. I mean, let's get into to your books, Linda. Um, which are wonderfully illustrated by um, Mick Minnick. And the first book, now this is a chunky book because um, it's a big book. Uh, it's The Pack and the First Generation. And this is the book this is where you start to introduce, you know, your main protagonist, your main character, Doc. Um, and then all the other characters that are there, Zeke, um, you know, his brother, Patch, his daughter, Rush, his son. Um, and, and Deacon, the three-legged the German short-haired pointer, because they're all um, German short-haired pointers. And then, of course, you've got Newt the Labrador Retriever, haven't you? Yes. And you've got other um, accomplishes all to uh, embellish this fabulous collection of books. So how did you create the characters? And, and are these stories, these tail wagging adventures in these books are they all loosely um tales that you've you know happened to experience with your own dogs uh, as a matter of fact john they are uh creating the characters was that was very it was easy because they're all from my 30s dogs and doc definitely uh we had many we had quite a few dogs that were like doc the wise older one that sort of trained the younger one, Zeke, uh, who is very arrogant in a way because he thinks he's so special because he, he has a spotted, uh, they call it tit coat. Hmm. And so he always thought he was from royalty. And then Patch, the daughter um, of, of dogs, uh, she was one of the best hunting dogs my husband ever had. She was fabulous. She could really point the, the, the quail. Um, and then you've got Rush who had a lot of, he was an adventurous dog. He, my, uh, my short hair pointers didn't like water, but a lot of short hair pointers do. So Rush would actually get by the pool. He was the only one that would do this and he would jump on a mat and he was perfect as long as he could stay on the mat and he would float around and all the other dogs would bark at him. So a lot of, in other words, the stories that we have in the field, mm. uh, the armadillo that Doc got, uh, the skunks that Zeke and some of the others got into, 
they are basically true adventures of what happens when a hunter goes into a field with some of these animals. And yet I've exaggerated them, obviously. Why not? That's what books are about, to exaggerate and to, you know, broaden a, a young kid's mind. Um, but for me, Linda, out of the, all the five books that make up the collection of the Hickory Docks Tales collection, the book that stands out most for me is Solitary Toes and Brown-Headed Cowbirds. And it stands out for me because you've got some of my favorite characters in this book. Um, you know, Zeke, um, who's, you know, as you said, he's a little bit arrogant. You know, he thinks, so oh, why should I have to do the work? You know, I'm a noble dog. Um, and, um, and Deacon, the um, three-legged dog, um, you know, could outrun uh, all the others. And, of course, BJ, the quarter horse. So this book, of course, is, uh, you know, it's all about how the dogs you know, react to BJ, the retired quarter horse, coming into their, their farm, their play area, their, their lives, and how they react to him and how they have a great race. Did you enjoy writing that book? Oh, I loved it. Uh, BJ, we, we've had, we had several horses, as a matter of fact, when we lived in Oklahoma. And BJ was definitely uh, a quarter horse. BJ would get into trouble because BJ would actually... Uh, go up to my husband's truck. If the, if the window was down, BJ would actually eat the lining in the truck. She would bite it off. And so she was really an unusual quarter horse, to say the least. Very, very unusual. Very, very un unusual. Uh, but that was what was delightful about it because the cowbird, of course, fell down on, DJ, on BJ. Zeke was supposed to have done the race. But Zeke, of course, is kind of a coward. So Zeke had an excuse. Zeke didn't feel well. So Zeke said Deacon would, would run the race. And I don't want to spoil the story, but that's kind of how it goes. And then Zeke ends up in some rather unusual things on the track. So, he does. Anyway. He does. And, oh, kids, you need to go and read this book because what happens to Zeke is just absolutely... Really? How's he got himself into that mess? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But this is what kids' books are about. It's fun, isn't it? Yes. Have it, fun it, reading. Yes, it, it really is. It's fun. You've got to make it fun. You've got to grab them at the future, in the, in the beginning and take them along. And yet they do learn things about oh, family and friends. You know, a child's mind is an empty blackboard, my mother used to say. You know, and you can put all the writings on there and you can mould them. They don't come with baggage like older people do. Um, in your other books, I uh, said so there's five in the collection here. Uh, you've got the remarkable story of Willie the Crow. Now, he's a great little character. I, I liked Willie the Crow. And then you've got the other book is Dark Willie and the Pack, Secret Gifts of Family. And then you've got Doc's Dog Days. So they're the other three books in the collection. And now these last three books, they tend to be shorter books and there's more illustrations in them. So are they mainly aimed at your five to six, seven-year-olds, whereas the first book, probably about eight, nine? Uh, yes, but I do believe on any of those books, Doc's Dog Days, um, to me, could go all the way up to the fifth grade. I'm always mm. saying that, uh, that yes, the, the last three were shorter, and I did that on purpose so that they would appeal to the younger children, so that they, could, would, they would be able to read them, obviously. Um, Doc's, uh, Dog Days is an activity book, and the children actually yeah. finish writing the story on each, and there's about 20 some different little stories, and they're very short, less than a page. And the child can go, and if they were too young, they can color in, in the illustration, or if they're a little bit older, after second, about second grade, third grade, and fourth, you know, they can go ahead and write the ending. Um, I, I love, yeah, I loved in the stories as well, and uh, you know, you've got Pete the Porcupine, 
Yes. Um, you've got Willie the Crow, and of course you've got BJ the Horse, you've got the Skunks, you've got the Armadillo. These are all accomplices to tell the, the tales, the adventures, these tail wagging tales of the dogs, aren't they? Yes. So tell me about Zeke now. How does he manage to get the porcupine's um, needles stuck on him? Well, because Zeke decided that he would get in front of any of the other dogs and he jumped into where the porcupine was. But that actually, Zeke was with the skunks. And so he, he, he jumped into the skunk, the cabbage patch with the, with the skunk. And the perfume of the, of the skunk, of course, was quite, the aroma was, was really a lot. And then Zeke realized um, and became ashamed of being, having skunk all over him. And so he learned in that experience that maybe it isn't so wise to try to cut in front of everybody. Maybe it would be smarter to stay behind and let someone else get into the skunk. And the porcupine with Rush, um, a lot of our dogs, they, there's a, something about the smell with the skunks and the porcupines, and they will go for them. And many times my husband would be picking out with his needle nose pliers uh, a lot of, those qu of the quills out of the dog's mouth and in their bodies and everything. And Rush, uh, Rush was one who loved to uh, get into all of those kind of troubles. And of course, Rush was Doc's son, wasn't he? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You see, kids, see everybody, these hunting dogs, it's all about a family of dogs and all the other animals that are around them and how they have great fun in the fields, you know, um, you know, flushing out the quail. These is what these stories are all about. And they're all beautifully done in uh, illustrated with wonderful pictures. They really are. Um, but Linda, in your repertoire of, you know, your writings over the years, um, you have another book, and which is not part of the Hickory Dock Tales collection. And now that book is The Wayward uh, Path of the Devil and Mr. Snake in the Garden of Eden. And clearly this book has some biblical base. And I'm wondering, are you dipping your toe here into telling kids about the story of Adam and Eve? And, and I also I mean, curious here, does religion mean um, a great deal to you in your own personal life? Yes, it really does. I mean, uh, and the reason I, I actually taught Sunday school for at least 20 years with the little ones mm. and the stories, I love the stories, the Bible stories to me are fabulous, but I also wanted the children to have a little bit of creativity with that. And in the wayward path of the devil and Mr. Snake, I use the Bible story. I didn't really veer from what happens in the end, but I use it so that children can see a little different perspective. And so that it's not always just cut and dry. And that's what, uh, that's what that story did for me. It is very different for me. I had wanted to write it uh, for over 20 years, and I finally decided to do it. I use, uh, you've got Lucy the lamb and Percy the dove, hmm. and I tell it from the perspective of animals more than I tell it from the perspective of Adam and Eve or God, but, uh, and the trees. There's two trees in there, the tree of life, and, um, you know, um, and, and the good and, you know, the, the, the good and evil, um, how God didn't want the Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of uh, not knowledge, I guess I should say. And yeah. so I try to put it in children's terms is what it amounts to. And when you look at the book, it's beautifully illustrated, isn't it? The colors are just, um, you know, vivacious, bold, bright, and uh, really, I, I thought they were really, you know, eye-catching. Um, was that deliberate? Yes. Or was uh, that you working with Mike? Yes. 
<laughs> he is a fabulous, uh, uh, he's a fabulous illustrator. And he and I talked a lot about it. Um, and so I made, sh you know, we made sure uh, that, for instance, if God was speaking, it's, it's a light, you know, it's coming down. And uh, with Adam and Eve, uh, you never really uh, saw them that clearly. I mean, you saw them. But Adam and Eve could have been anybody or anything. I mean, you know, any human yeah. being, no matter what. And that's what I tried to do. I kind of left it to the imagination of the family, the parents reading to the children and getting something out, out of it. It's, it's, it ends up the same, and I've said this over and over again, but it's different. It has a different um, point, so to speak. Do you think, oh, so it's a different book, and that's why it's separate. Do you think um, Doc, Seek, and Patch, and Rush, and Deacon, and Newt would love to go into the Garden of Eden? Do you think they'd have fun in there? Yes. What would, what would they do. get up to? What would they get up to? Boy, I tell you, <laughs> <laughs> they would have a good time in the Garden of Eden, and they would, they would be into everything that was in there. Definitely. <laughs> I, can, I can see him. Absolutely. I can really see him with all the fruit and stuff. Oh, and in no. that book, we didn't, you, you didn't, we didn't mention it, but uh, I make, the devil has a part in that too, but the devil always has some problems with Percy the duck. Uh, so uh, there are some interesting things, but the animals, the dogs would have loved it. I mean, um, your grandchildren, what do they think to your books? Are they your biggest they, critics? Is <laughs> they exactly. grandma, really? Yeah, right. Well, we used to gather around and when the, when the grandchildren were younger, we would try to write stories is what it amounts to. And so, yes, they, uh, they like the stories. Um, and, I, and yes, they are. They can be critics too. And because of that, uh, they helped a little bit with the books too. I have a granddaughter who's fabulous with art, seriously. And uh, she can draw anything. And, and maybe someday she and I could do a book together. That would be fun. Why not? Bring, right. you know, bring her in, you know, get her involved. Um, so, I mean, kids, everybody, these are fabulous little books. And Oh, I've absolutely loved the um, the stories. I actually, I actually enjoyed the stories of the uh, brown-headed cowbirds, you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I saw that, and I did say to you, are they, you know, um, cuckoos? And, you, and we both agreed, no, they're not cuckoos because, you know, the brown-headed cowbirds, they, they um, take over the nest, don't they? And... Um, and I just thought the story of, you know, when Zeke's under the tree and it's, you know, he's again, he's got himself into a mess there and the cowbirds are just sitting there watching going. Right. <laughs> Did you love writing that little story there? That's pretty Oh, I loved it. Yes. In. yes. Uh, uh, yeah, Zeke gets some stuff in his head. That's absolutely right. From the cowbirds. From the cowbirds. And I thought that was good. And in researching it, you have to research your animals. And, and hopefully I've done that with, with the armadillos, the, the cowbirds, the Willie the Crow. Um, the cowbirds I thought were interesting because they really did get on the cows and things like that. And they were always, you know, they're the birds that get on the animals. Uh, and, and the cowbird to me, was a little bit like, like BJ and Zeke in a way, uh, you know, kind of out for themselves, so to speak. So, now, yeah. Willie the Crowbird uh, gets himself into a little bit of trouble. He tries to get into the, into the house and Patch has to rescue him on a few occasions, doesn't she? Right, and that's actually a true story, uh, really? John. Now, it's, it, it is exaggerated, but another, and it wasn't in my house, but there, uh, I had a friend that had, actually had a crow because they're smart. They are very oh, smart. smart. Mm. Yes, they are very smart. And the crow got into the house and she would open the refrigerator door and she would ah. give the crow 
from food. And so that, and although it's imagination and creativity, that actually is partly a true story. So yes, Willie the Crow, part of the family. I, I, I assume that, so that's why I thought, I'm going to ask Linda this, because uh, I think she's going to say, oh, this actually happened, or it's a story that's, you know, back in your head there. And mm-hmm. I've just brought it to the fore and telling all the kids, because I thought, cheeky little crow. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, your next book, uh, Linda, uh, Chatty the Hen Pheasant. That's the next one. Is it finished? Is it ready to go? Or when is it coming out? And can you give us a little insight here as to what Chatty's going to be about? I will be glad to, John. Uh, Chatty is at the publishers now, Archway Publishing, and it should be coming out within the next month. Uh, Chatty the Hen Pheasant. This is also another partially true story. Nassau, another black lab that that my husband and I had, was a fabulous hunting dog and would go out and try to bring back pheasants and all sorts of stuff. And uh, Chatty happens to be a hen pheasant that's pretty darn smart. She's very smart. She's cute. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yes. She's cute. (laughs) Right. And uh, when Nassau gets into the snow, which they did get into a blizzard up in the Dakotas, and Nassau actually had pulled out a hen pheasant. And uh, Chatty starts talking to Nassau because she wants to be let down. She does not want to be uh, obviously held by the dog. Uh, Labs have a soft mouth or that's what they try to train the dogs to be. Uh, Also with the German short hairs is that they could carry the, the bird, but not to crunch down on it. That's the whole point of it. And Nassau had a wonderfully soft mouth. And Nassau was trying to get Chatty back to the hunter. And Chatty just is really determined that Nassau is not going to get her back to the, hunt, to the hunter. And so I don't want to tell the whole story because I need to purchase the book, but it is cute, I think. And I think no. it has a good ending. And it's a short book. It's a book that could be out for Christmas. Yes, absolutely. Ah. Linda, where can people get your books? They can get my books at www.harkybooks.com. Can they get them on Amazon? Yes, and that is that you can buy them from Amazon directly, or you can, if you go into my website, it has to buy them from Amazon and also from Archway. So you could do it either, either way. Can they get them from Barnes and Noble? Uh, I, they, a couple of them were at Barnes and Noble. Okay. I don't know if they're there now. Okay. But yes. Well, Linda, I have thoroughly enjoyed reading your books. I just wish that you had written them when I was five or nine. So you're getting told off for that. Because, oh, kids, they are just wonderful. Grandparents, parents, you know, if you want to buy a book for your kids, go and have a look at Linda's um, Hickory Dot Tales collection. They'd be great presents for Christmas um, because they are beautifully written, beautifully illustrated. And it's, so it's been fascinating to get an insight both into to you, Linda, and to your enthralling books with all their amusing um, quaint storylines, um, exquisitely stole, even told stories. And I've loved the free-spirited doggy characters. And mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Zeke, for me, takes the crown. <laughs> I just loved him. Because he gets into all Thanks. sorts of trouble. Hey, you know, why not? So for me, kids, grandparents, parents, this is a book for kids age range five to nine. There, it's a must read. Go and have a look at them. And kids, if you do get them, thoroughly enjoy reading them because I did. So it's just left for me to say, as I say at the end of every podcast, everybody, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching wherever you are in the world. Until next time, stay safe.